that good now. All right, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 23. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord has taken from Adam made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now the bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called a woman, because she was taken out of Man, May the Lord bless his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why are you guys quiet? Is it cold on you guys? It's a little bit quiet. When it's too quiet like this, I get a little bit intimidated. Amen. <laughs> All right. This morning, I'm not talking about marriage. Just to uh, like a disclaimer right now. I know every time this test is read... The first thing that comes to mind is talking about uh, marriage. But this morning, I want to talk about something completely different and also in relation to relationship. Uh, if you were here before Thanksgiving, the Sunday prior to that, we talked about blood is thicker than water. I'm talking about the need for solid relationship in our lives, the need to have people in our community, in the need to have strong support system, both emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically. And we saw that when you value relationship, you know, things go well and better for you. Because like they say in the world, no man is an island. We all need each other. And the Sunday after that, we talked about, you see, and when we began to talk about the bleeding heart, when a heart is hurting, and when a heart is hurting, when a heart is hurting without a strong support system and a strong community, that heart becomes broken and more, it is difficult for that heart to find help and to find restoration. And so we all need each other. And as the world is getting darker and darker and darker, I want to tell you, child of God, never be deceived by the worldly concept that tells you you don't need anybody, I don't need anyone. That is a lie from the pit of hell. We need each other. We need community. We need one another. No man is created to be an island. We were not created in isolation. And uh, like the scripture says in Genesis, our Father who art in heaven, the creator of all mankind, when he made Adam, Adam was surrounded by things, by animals, by, uh, by, uh, by gold and, and, and treasures of all kinds. But in the midst of plenty, in the midst of the crowd, Adam was still alone. It was God that said, it is not good for man to be alone, that no man can survive alone. No man can function alone. No man, and he's talking about man and woman. And so it is a dangerous thing for you to buy the concept or the idea that you don't need anybody. People who say that don't most of the time do not end up well. And that is also a lie because deep down inside of them, they feel so empty and they desire community. Amen. And so isolation is an emotional separation from others 
willingly or unwillingly. You know, isolation is a dangerous thing. And isolation can happen as a result of a prevailing circumstances. And that circumstance can force you to willingly or unwillingly separate yourself onto isolation. This is an isolation that is brought upon a man, not by, uh, by force. Uh, and, and, and like I said, you can be surrounded by things and still be isolated. Adam was surrounded by animals and by his dogs and cats and cattle. But God still saw that he was still suffering from aloneness. So you can be in a crowded place and still be isolated. Do you know that? You can be in a family reunion and still feel alone. You can be sitting right now, you're sitting in the church right now, surrounded by people, and you still feel alone. You feel disconnected because isolation is an emotional thing, is a spiritual thing. So the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, he said, two are better than one. It's not talking about any kind of two. There are some two that is a disaster, that is a liability. It's not just any two that is better. There are some companionship that you have that is a disaster, that is a recipe for destruction. And so when the Bible says two are better than one, it's talking about solid, healthy people in your life. And so you cannot be joined together with a beast. You cannot be joined together with a wicked fellow and still say that is better. Amen. And so there's some joining that is a disaster. And so when the Bible says two are better than one, it's talking about healthy, emotional, sound, balanced relationship. And we all need that. Because isolation is a dangerous tool in the hand of the enemy. I want you to listen to me this morning. Because if I, I mean, of us remember what happened a few years ago. Amen. The lockdown. Right. Do you know that as a result of that two years incident, many relationship was destroyed? Families were broken apart mentally, emotionally, and physically up to date, your parents that you grew up with, suddenly because of a demonic setup, you no longer talk to each other. Your relationship was severed. Many relationships were severed, was damaged beyond whatever you can describe. Because of what? Isolation. Isolation is a dangerous tool in the hand of the enemy. Because what isolation does is that it puts you in a position to be forgotten. It puts you in a place of abandonment. Isolation, this, because this is not, I'm not talking about being alone. You can be alone and still not alone. Amen. Isolation is a dangerous, destructive weapon. Isolation leads to self-harm. Isolation will make you compromise your moral and spiritual integrity if you're not careful. Proverbs chapter 18. I'm just giving you a breakdown and introduction this morning. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire, and he breaks out against all sound judgment. Isolation will make you break out every sound judgment will elude you. And I want you to listen to this, and you can write this down. Always remember that the blessings of community far outweigh outweigh her faults and her shortcomings. The blessings of a community. The blessings of having people around you. The blessings of being involved with people. And I say that personally, even for me, like I never stop boasting about my church here. 
because I, I learned something. Like I said, this is the longest since I was born till date. Grand Cash is the longest place I've ever stayed in all my life. 17 years of my life nonstop. And it comes with it, its up and downs, but the blessing of the community, especially of my church community, far outweigh its faults and the shortcoming. I'm not saying the church is perfect. But when I look at my family, when I look at my children, I am grateful to God that we found a community to thrive in. And this community helped to nurture the, their moral integrity, their emotional strength and stability. The, he taught them to see what consistency in relationship and community is. And so there is power in community. So the blessings of a community, of having a community fellowship, far outweighs his shortcoming. But what the enemy does to you and to me is that he makes us see the shortcomings and the faults. We see the wrong more than we see the good. We focus on the bad and the negative side of the community than the blessings. We focus more on what is wrong, especially let's use the church when the Bible said, do not forsake the coming together of, uh, of the brethren. God is talking, it's just, it's more than just coming to church on a Sunday morning. He's talking about the power of fellowship, the consistency of growing together, true, thick, and thin. Especially if you're a young person and a young family, nobody here is perfect. I have my fault, you know, I have my issues, we all have issues. I have people, I have offended people here, people have offended me here. That is true. That is because we are all human beings. You know, you understand what I'm saying? But if we had focus on that, amen, if you focus on those things, because what keeps me going, let me give myself as an example. What keeps me going, what sustains my relationship is that I always try, I measure people's action, not just by one incident only. What a lot of us do is that you can be in a strong relationship with people for five years, six years, seven years, and everything has been going well, and they will make one mistake which is not their lifestyle, which is not something that they are used to, and just one little fault, one little mistake, one little shortcoming, and suddenly that seven years, five months, six years, three years of fellowship is thrown down the gutter. You suddenly forget that, and you just focus on that little one mistake, and you are willing to throw away everything the last seven years two years of strong fellowship of unity of love that you enjoyed together i'm not talking about terrible people i'm not talking about irreparable mistake i'm not talking about obvious faults in people i'm not talking about people who are not willing to change i'm not talking about people who are not willing to take correction because if you are with people and their good action outweighs their bad action. Focus on the good and build on that and nurture that and strengthen that because it will do you good and it will do them good also. People learn from that. I use, <laughs> I, I, I'll give you one example, one quick story here with uh, Courage who is the older one and he's grown now. And he said something about he talks about, we talks about, he talks about people in the church. And he mentioned one incident that I was trying to, I thought I was shitting him because that's what I do to my children. I will never. You can ask my wife. We can't, I can't complain about the church at home. <laughs> no. I will not talk ill of anybody. Even when things happen, so this person, you know, put up an attitude. And, I, and as a 10 years old, you know, 
Children don't forget things. Remember that. Be careful how you treat them. You see, children respond to love more than they respond to your instruction. Do you know that? And so when you love a child, they can pick it. And that's why they say bad teachers teach the subject, but good teachers love the children. Children will respond more to the teacher that love on them than the one who is a good teacher. Because love is a spiritual thing. And so anyway, Curry, I didn't know that he picked that. And so a few years ago, now he's an adult, and he began to tell me the story. And he said, oh, when, that, uh, when this auntie did that, he used to think that in his heart, he used to think that she was a very mean auntie. You know, and he has that in his heart, right? But if that was encouraged, he said, but now that he's older, he could see where she was coming from. You see? You see, oh, now I understand her better. I understand what she was trying to do. But he said, when I was young, when she did that, I used to think that she was so mean. But what I'm trying to say is that if I had reacted alongside with him, and say, oh, because of that little action, oh, that, oh, this place is not good for us anymore. And I, oh, I take my kids and left, right? Now, they, I, I've robbed him of an opportunity of growing in grace. I robbed him of an opportunity of growing in community. Now, this is home. They are looking, they look forward to church. They look forward to coming back home. It's like they wish they can be going to school from Grand Cash. Even at this age, they look forward to, they say, oh, they wish they can. Oh, can they come home? Can they come this weekend? Who is in the church? Uh, is this person in the church this Sunday? Did this person come? And they will ask questions about why? Because they grew up in a community. There is power in community. And so the blessings of your community far outweigh its fault. Don't let the enemy isolate you from the people that God has placed in your life. Because when we are designed for fellowship, we are designed for fellowship. Don't let the enemy lie to you. We are designed for fellowship. And I, I can't emphasize this enough because as the world is getting darker, the love of many is waxing cold. People are becoming lovers of themselves. Wickedness is multiplying. We need each other like never before. We need to stand together. This is, this is a medical definition of isolation. This is scientific definition. I'll read it for you. Isolation is a state of feeling lonely and alone without friends, family, or help. It is the feeling of being in a crowd yet feel surrounded by nothing. It is the sense, the sense of isolation is, a very, is very deeply felt by those who are lonely, being alone and being lonely are two different things. You can be alone and not lonely. I love being alone. That is me, personally. I can be locked up in a room for, I don't, you see, I don't know, I, when people say they are lonely, I can't relate to it. This is me personally. I don't understand loneliness. I don't understand the word I'm bored or I'm lonely because I can be locked up in a room by myself for two weeks. Honestly. And I will feel nothing. I will go, I will sleep, wake up, eat, and lie down. My late grandfather used to be, my maternal granddad used to be very angry with me. He would come in because I was sharing a room with him when I was young. I would lock myself up in the room and turn off the light. 
He will come in and turn on the light. He said, what kind of boy are you? Get out. Go out there and walk around with your friends. And he was a very funny man. He was a soldier. And he would encourage, go, and go, go to the bar and get drunk. <laughs> but I, I, I enjoyed my own company. So there is a difference between being alone and being lonely. You can be in a crowd and still be lonely. You can be lying next to somebody on the same bed and still be alone and lonely. A loneliness is a state of the heart. So isolation, therefore, is a state of mind, an emotion brought about by feeling of separation from other human beings. When you are separated, willingly or unwillingly from people, nobody is designed to thrive on its own. Don't let the enemy lie to you. When people are alone, many struggle with burden, anxiety, addiction, and the sorrows of opportunity loss. Studies show that loneliness and social isolation are associated with a higher risk of what? Health problem. This is science. This is from a medical journal. Let me read it again. Studies show that loneliness and social isolation are, are, are associated with higher risk for health problems such as heart disease, depression, and many other diseases. They say even type 2 diabetes. These are medical journals. And I, it went further to say if you are a, in a poor head, you may be more likely to be socially isolated or lonely. So, social isolation can cause causes decrease in white I don't know what that means, but this is what I, social isolation causes decrease in vital matter in brain region, critical for thinking. So isolation affects your thinking. And one other thing I was reading there over the weekend, and they said uh, most of this uh, memory loss and all this other disease also can be caused by isolation. These are medical facts. So when God says, from the beginning, the first thing God thought, the first equation, the problem God solved was the problem of isolation. It is not good for man to be alone. So how come you and I can say, I don't need anybody? I can do church alone at home. Being alone, doing church, this is not about worshiping or praying. This is about your emotional health and stability. The Lord God that brought us together, that said, come together, knows what he's doing. If God, if it, if it was okay for me to be at home and serve God by myself, God would have said so. Amen. God would have said so. We need each other. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 10 to 12. I want to read that quickly. Let's read that together. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I read from verse 9. Two are better than one because they have what? Reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. We need each other. Let me read verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is what? Alone. Woe to him who, what? who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up again. Woe to the one who is alone when he falls, when he's in trouble, when he needs help, when he needs encouragement, when he needs support system. 
when he needs people to come around them, when they're going through stuff and they are by themselves, when they have no shoulder to lean on in their time of grief, in their time of sorrow, in their hour of disappointment, in their days of struggle. Going through life by yourself, going through the pain of divorce alone, going through the pain of dealing with that troubled child all by yourself, going through the pain of that sickness and that terminal disease by yourself, going through the crisis and the issue of life alone. The Bible says, Woe is the man, who woman who falls and has no one, nobody around them to lift them up. I know some people, some of us, the isolation is not intended, it's not intentional, and sometimes it was forced upon us, and but sometimes we just allow little issues to get in the way. Some of the reasons that people quickly, the, look, let me show you some of the things that the enemy uses to isolate us, and, and we're going to pray, and I just want you to take note of that and check yourself. You know, are you going through? Why did you cut off from this person? I'm not talking about people who are mean, people who are, you know, someone I'm talking about. Amen. There are bad people. <laughs> I'm not telling you to just go, you know, that's why the Bible says two are better than one. I'd say it's not just any two, not a beast, not a wicked man. Not a wicked woman. Not people who want your destruction. Not people who want your downfall. But I'm talking about people who meant well for you. People who you have a wonderful relationship with in the beginning. At the beginning, you guys have been going out together. You've been in a community for two years and three years. No, nothing has gone wrong. And suddenly, in some one little sleep where you know that this is not in this person's habit. This is not his attitude. Like I said about uh, courage, giving that story, right? It was an event that was a one-time action that maybe the person was going through an emotional moment that time. Maybe that person came to the church that day. She was already tired or going through some crisis at home. You don't even know what is going on. And maybe out of that uh, whatever situation, she just lashed out. Because that is not the person's character. And so you cannot use that simple one mistake or two now to define that person and labor that person and then begin to project that person as a bad person and rob yourself of, of, of an opportunity to grow and to strengthen each other. Right? Rejection. Rejection by friends and family. Rejection. You can come into this church this morning and you can say hello to somebody and that person actually was not paying attention. And if you're suffering from the spirit of rejection, you may begin to feel rejected and say, how can I say hello to them? And they ignored me. And I don't want to have anything to do with those people. They are not friendly. They are not kind. But that could be just an isolated incident. Amen. And so if you're dealing with low self-esteem and the spirit of rejection is hanging around you, 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 every action, people's action will project that same thing into your spirit, man, and the enemy will keep using that to isolate you from people. And you feel that nobody wants me. Nobody likes me. And that is the life in the pit of hell. And, uh, and people who are afraid of fear of intimacy will make you isolate yourself because of your past experience. The other thing also that can make people feel isolate themselves, I'm talking about this self-isolation that is destructive, guilt and shame. Guilt and shame based on what you have done, based on the past based on some terrible things that has happened to your life, maybe the kind of life you lived. Amen. Have you ever come to a place, 
You know, a lot of people say, oh, they are judged. And I always tell them, I say, nobody judge you. It is your conscience that judge you most of the time. Amen. Have you ever sat down with people without even saying anything? They say, you are judging me. <laughs> you don't even have to say a word. And they say, oh, why are you judging me? No, nobody is judging you. It's your conscience. You need to deal with that, the root of the shame and the guilt that you feel. And then you realize that nobody actually cares. And so guilt and shame can lead people to isolate themselves from community. Because you feel that everybody knows your story. They're looking at me because I was a drunk yesterday. Oh, I was a prostitute. I was a drug addict. I was involved in so so and so. But God has redeemed me. And you can meet one or two callous people that may try to remind you of your past. But you always need to know that if you, any man be in Christ, behold, is a new creation. You may have done what they say you did. You are not the same person. You need to allow the blood of Christ Jesus to effectively have its way in your heart and in your life. If you are saved, your sins are forgiven. Don't let the enemy use guilt and shame to intimidate you and to keep you away from your friends and family. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we saw the story of David after sleeping with Bathsheba and killing her husband. The guilt and the shame make him just, he, he just isolated himself. It took the grace of God to restore him back together. Fear also can make people isolate themselves. Fear and intimidation. You are afraid of what people, you look at people and you are afraid of them. David always said to me that some of his friends are afraid of me. <laughs> so they don't want to come to our house. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Right? So that fear is, making, is robbing them of wonderful fellowship. Because if they had come, I would have cooked for them, amen, and entertained them, which I love to do. But fear is keeping them away from what? Experiencing that. Fear is real. A lot of people don't want to come to church because they are afraid of the way they, what if I come in, they will not receive me well. Of course, they may have gone to some churches and they didn't receive them well. It happens. You can't really blame them. But that fear can become a stigma and a stronghold that will keep you away from experiencing genuine fellowship and it will isolate you the more and keep getting you into the gutter of depression, despair. And fear also comes with what low self-esteem and insecurity. Low self-esteem, I'm not good enough. I can't fit him. A lot of what I have people once uh, in this town, people, I have met one or two people that have asked me, can I come to your church? Are we allowed to come? Amen. No, this is a true story. I've met somebody who came to me once, a young, a young lady and said, a teenager, he said, oh, can I, am I allowed to come to your church? I, I felt so grieved in my spirit. And that is how the devil keeps people away. Because it creates a wrong perception of what the church is. And as you as a church of Christ, because the church is not this building, the church is you and me. So when you are out there in the community, project the church as a loving, welcoming, kind, caring, compassionate home. Let people know that this is a family that they should come and be a part of. And this is the focus of Cornerstone Mountain Assembly. If you are home listening to me, our mission is to create an, an environment, a contagious environment filled with the love of God because we know that people are really lonely. People are really isolated. People are really going through a lot emotionally. And God has raised us in this community to create an atmosphere 
of a contagious love and joy. We are not perfect. We may not do it well. And this is why I tell people, when somebody does something that you don't understand, I may say things that you don't understand, I may act in a way that may not go down well with you at the moment, don't go home with it. Confront me. John, why did you have to say that? Why did you act that way? And I can say, oh, did I do that? <laughs> then I have room to say I'm sorry. But uh, many of us, we are so afraid, we are so insecure in our heart that when people offend us, we don't confront them in love. We are too afraid. So we carry it in our heart and it becomes a stronghold that leads to bitterness and unforgiveness and then thereby isolating us completely. And we, it robs us of the benefit of what it means to have a family. I can't trade this family for anything. Amen. This is me personally. Not just because I'm a pastor. The benefit of this fellowship far outweighs the negative, the shortcoming of everyone. Amen. A lot of people, they get, some people get, like Cheryl, she gets on my other side a lot. Amen. That's the truth. <laughs> Amen. But the, the, the good far outweighs the bad. And for me, if you do anything to me, why you can't see me quarrel with people is because if I can endure it for two hours and go to sleep, it's not as bad anymore. When I wake up, it's done. Because I, I look at the greater good. And so 17 years of being in this church together, the Ferragates, all the McCarmons, uh, the Livingstones, and all the people that I've met here in the last 17 years, uh, the Sacreys, and everyone that we have trucked together, we've robbed each other the wrong way. Amen. And my young teddy bear now, he's joined the crew. Amen. <laughs> you know, and all of us, every one of us, we are going together. We will offend each other. We will hurt each other. As long as it's not intentional, let us deal with it. Let us embrace each other. Let us address each other in love so that we can create a community that is whole, that is awesome. I'm saying this this morning to us that look at all these children coming to the church. Amen? We didn't have this three years ago. Four years ago, this was not there. We prayed for it. God has opened up. People are coming. Children are coming. When I think about the benefit and the joy of raising my children under this building. I want many families. I want every family to have that same grace, that same opportunity. I want to be a part of the stories. When my children tell me their stories of people that influences their life, and oh, how Mrs. Ferragotti taught her this, oh, how Grandpa McCammon said this, how Grandpa Sacre said this, how this person did this, how this person said this. You know, you know, my heart leaped for joy. And then I realized that I am not the only one that has sown into their life. Where I missed it, God has raised people around them to correct them and to nurture them. Where, where my weakness is, they find strength in somebody else. And they say, oh, dad can fix a vehicle. But grandpa secret knows how to fix vehicle. And this person knows that. So that he knows that it's a man's thing. You, you know what I mean? And, and you go to this person and you go, oh, dad is the one cooking. Okay, Brian also knows how to cook. So cooking is not just a dad's thing. It's a man's thing. And they learn from every one of us. going to pray. I'll stop here. 
I want you to just bow your head in prayer. I just just want to stop here before we take our communion. I'm just going to stop here now. I just just want you to pray. I want you to pray and ask God to help you. I know some of us, you are here this morning or you're home listening to me. Maybe you have been betrayed, you've been let down. Maybe some strange things happen. Some of us have isolated ourselves from God because of tragedy. You prayed and it didn't happen. Especially when death occurred suddenly. Especially when disappointment comes, either from man or sometimes in your relationship with God. You expected God to do this and didn't happen. And that has caused you to isolate yourself completely and say there is no need. And maybe somebody did something to you that really hurts you. And God is asking me to tell you, pray this morning as the Holy Spirit and to help you to forgive. Maybe there's tragedy. Maybe you were disappointed or betrayed. Don't let the spirit of isolation continue to terminate and torment you. Isolation is a silent killer. Ask God to give you the strength. Maybe it's your loved ones at home. And this is not just talking about church. I'm talking about your family. Maybe there's a friend. Maybe somebody here listening to me. Maybe there's a friend that has been so kind. You guys grew up together. You've done things well. And the little thing, the thing that has severed your relationship between you and that person is not that big. I'm not, it's something big, but it's, not, it's, it's forgivable. It's forgivable. And the enemy is using that to rob you of that relationship. And it's isolating you from that person. God wants you to restore that. God wants you to restore that. God, I, I pray that the Lord will call, help you to find help this morning in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Father, we exalt your name. Father, we exalt your name. Thank you, eternal rock of ages. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Can the ushers that helped this morning come again, please? This is what is, uh, we're going to do. Can come? This is what you're going to help me do. We look at me. We're going to take a communion. In First Kings chapter 19, just... In First Kings chapter 19... This is what we're going to do this morning. The person sitting next to you, I know because of all the uh, hygiene and things like that, the ushers will stand. This is how we're going to do it, and we're going to take it together. The ushers will stand at the end. They will pass the plate to you. You will, give, you will pass the plate to the person next to you, and they will pick it. Uh, do you understand how... Uh, because I would have said, serve them, but because of all this health issue and other people's worry. But just pass, when they pass, they will stand at the end. You will pass it over and let the person, you hold the plate for the person next to you. They will take the, uh, the communion, but the cup, the bread, but the cup, you will pick it and give it to the next person. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So let's serve each other. And when you get home today, I want to challenge you. Go around now so that we can do it quickly. So take, uh, yeah, like I said in the front there, take that and give it to somebody else, and that person will take and give you theirs. And that's the way it's done. When you get home today, when you get home today, I want you to call that person you've not called in a long time. Honestly. I want you to call them. Send them a message. You know the person I'm talking about. Amen. Huh? That one person that robbed you the wrong way. <laughs> 
that one cousin of yours, that brother of yours, that friend of yours, they've not done you unpardonable sin, but they rob you the wrong way. You just can't stand them. And for a good reason. I want you to call them. By doing that, you are breaking something. I'm not saying restore relationship with them, but I want you to reach out to one of the most difficult person in your life this week. That person that you find hard to relate with. I want you to reach out to them. I'm not saying call them to sit down to have coffee and just say, oh, I just called to see how you are doing. And they say, fine, you can just drop the phone after that. <laughs> and see how I can tell you the healing that is going to come to you. Amen. Is that, am I saying the right thing this morning? <laughs> Let us reach out to somebody. Reach out to a loved one. Reach out to your brother. Reach out to them. Show them love. Show them mercy. Show them forgiveness. Let us restore each other's relationship. And if you are home and you've not been going to church, I'm not talking about the lot of people outside of Grand Cash also that are watching us. If you are in your home and you didn't go to church today because of a hurt, because of bitterness, because of unforgiveness, I beg you, child of God, whether you are in Africa, you are in Europe, you are in North America, you are in Canada here, find a place to go and reconnect with God and with God's people. And if you are in Grand Cash and you are not going to church, there are about three churches in town. Amen? We have the Catholic Church, we have the, uh, the Lutheran is there, and Alliance Church is there also. Go and reconnect with God and begin to fellowship with the body of Christ. And you will be glad that you did. I'm encouraging you, child of God, the darkness that is coming in the world today, we need each other. You cannot afford to go through life by yourself. You can't raise your children. You cannot depend on the government to help raise your children. If you're a parent, I want to encourage you plug into a church for the sake of your children and so that they can find help and find emotional and spiritual stability. This is the charge to every one of us. Amen. Okay, if you hold it, can we all stand up, please, with your communion? If you've gotten it, and then we can give... Oh, the see... Thank you, Jesus. Just begin to ask God for grace this morning. Begin to speak into your life. Begin to pray that the voice of the blood will begin to speak mercy. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Just ask God for healing in your heart. Uh, somebody needs God to cleanse their heart from bitterness from bitterness and unforgiveness this morning. Ask God, I know that it's not easy, and I hear you. I hear you. The Holy Spirit said to tell you, I hear you. Thank you, sir. I hear you. I give you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The Holy Spirit says, I hear you. I'm sorry that I've taken a lo lot longer time. If you're visiting with us, I don't stay this long before, but I believe this is so deep in my heart. It's been on my heart for days, and I just needed to speak it out And as, just, as I just get this utterance. And I beg you this morning, ask God to heal your heart. Ask God to heal your heart. You need to let go. You need to let go. I can't emphasize that enough. Somebody needs to ask God to help him or her to forgive. Forgive them. I'm not saying invite them to your house for coffee. 
I'm not saying go on vacation together again with them. I'm, I'm just saying release them from your heart. Let the blood wash that sin of unforgiveness and bitterness and just let them go and bless them. We receive, Lord, this night and this afternoon. Father, we sanctify that which is in our hand. We cover it with the blood of Jesus. Lord, even as it was in the beginning, so shall it be. The broken body breaks the yoke. This afternoon, as we break this bread, may the yoke of unforgiveness, bitterness, isolation, depression, be broken off our neck in the mighty name of Jesus. The body of Christ broken for you. Eat. The new covenant that speak life, forgiveness, mercy, hope, and love. We take this as a body. Through this communion table, we pray for unity, reconciliation in family today in the name of Jesus. Take the blood of Jesus shed for you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord show you mercy. May he show you and your family on mercy, love, compassion. I pray that there will be reconciliation, restoration of relationship. I pray for that God, that marriages will be repaired. The bond between parents that was broken will be mended right now. That broken relationship between the mother and the daughter be restored. That relationship between the father and son and mother be restored in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, eternal rock of ages, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. I'm sorry for taking so much time, but the Lord bless you, and have a wonderful afternoon. Amen.